celebrated a really big birthday this year. So I thought, well, I'm not very well traveled, so I'm going to go somewhere that really takes me out of my comfort zone. And I chose India. Hello. I'm beginning to wish that I'd gone for Tuscany. India. This vast subcontinent is home to 1.2 billion people. It's ancient and modern, it's bustling and serene. It's timelessly traditional and yet has one of the world's fastest growing economies. It was, of course, part of the British Empire and therefore part of our history. When I was five years old, I did a school project on India and I've been longing to come here ever since. To be honest, I'm a little bit scared. Will it live up to my expectations? I've travelled from rural Devon and here I am, over 6,000 miles from home. Starting in the north, I plan to work my way right down to the southern tip, from the dry, hot cities of Rajasthan down to Kerala's sleepy backwaters. my journey in Varanasi, one of the oldest and holiest cities in the world. There are well over three million people here in this very, very small town. And I think they're all in this street today. It's incredibly busy and incredibly hot and everybody goes about their business, either driving these putts for the tourists or in their cars or selling things. And no one seems to crash into anybody else. I'm starting here and I'm meeting someone who lives in this town. His name's Ravi and he's going to show me round. I'm going to find him first, though. A lot of people. Varanasi, also known as Benares, is the cultural and religious capital of India. This sacred pilgrimage site is said to be the beating heart of the Hindu universe, so it feels like the perfect place to begin my travels. Hi, Ravi, I'm namaste, Caroline. Namaste, namaste, namaste. Lovely to meet How are you? you. How are you? Really good, thank you. How are you feeling, Varanasi? Varanasi is situated on the banks of the River Ganges, India's largest and holiest river. The River Ganges is also known as Mother Ganga. This river is a goddess to the people of India. To them, it represents life and purity. Hindus from all around the world flock here every day to worship. However, the Ganges is said to be one of the dirtiest, most polluted rivers in the world. Human and animal excrement are discarded into the water and can be seen floating alongside household rubbish, corpses and industrial waste. So these people are praying in the river, they're bathing, it's very, very important for them. So how many people do that? Yes, uh, every day 1,500 pilgrims. 1,500? Pilgrims as well foreigner tourists come Varanasi every, every day. day. Every day? Every day they come, they first put oil massage. Oh, they massage they, in the morning yes. every day? Then jump in the water and swim till that cat. Swim to the next their cat? Cloth, their cloth, you know, first they put their cloth there, massage, then walk. After walking, jogging, reach here. Then jump and swimming. In my mind's eye, I always thought the Ganges was just about religion, but actually it's about sport, it's about health, it's about right, life, it's about very right. you understand yeah, that? Yeah, I really yes. get it now, which I didn't yes. understand before. The river Ganges is the lifeblood of people in India. For many Hindus, it's not just a river, but a way of life. They believe that the river has the power to cleanse the body, wash away sins, and take the soul to heaven. People travel huge distances to cremate their loved ones and to scatter their ashes in this holy water. They believe that this is the only way to free the soul from the endless cycle of life, death and rebirth allowing them to finally enter heaven. You saw people were doing ritual with water, pouring water. Huh? Yeah, on their faces. Yeah. Yes, we use Ganges water for the ritual. And we recite three slogans, three mantras. Okay. Yes, like this way. Om Keshavaye Namaha Om Madhavaye Namaha Om Narayanaya Namaha And third, fourth time, wash it. 
ओम मशी के शाये नमः देन स्टार्ट आवर प्रेयर एंड रेस्ट लाइक दिस व्हाट्स इट टेस्ट लाइक यू नो मे बी यू डोंट बिलीव सपोज माय स्किन कट हियर आई एम नॉट ऑन्टी मैन टू पुट इट हियर समथिंग जस्ट वॉश इन द वाटर फ्यू सेकंड्स यू विल फील ड्यूरिंग द वॉशिंग इट क्रंचिंग लाइक द डिटॉल सेवलॉन Really? The water, yes, yes, yes. Antiseptic. Antiseptic. Just two, three day, you wash in Ganges water, it will cure. Do you think, though, Ravi, that's only for people that live here, though, and are used to the water? Because I, I mean, because uh, us foreigners, we come here, Actually, and madam, sometimes are, we're quite ill. No, 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 I don't suggest to you, no. uh, foreigner, to do that no. because they are not used to, and their body has not used to for the temperature and atmosphere of. So I won't drink any now. Do you want? Have some chai. No, I don't want. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> yeah. Don't <be. laughs> yeah. I, I don't I've got a lot. I've got a lot of travelling yet to do. No, no, no. During the travel, you have to be careful. I do have to be yes. careful. My back passage through India. Yeah. yeah. The water looks filthy to me, but for hundreds of millions of people, the Ganga is the foundation of spiritual and physical life. is the most sacred, culturally rich and chaotically colourful place I've ever been to. The poverty is hugely apparent, yet it's an incredibly vibrant and peaceful city. And despite my early fears, it's an amazingly unthreatening place. I'm keen to experience everyday life here, so Ravi has arranged for me to stay with a local family, his friends, and household names on the Indian music scene, Ragini and Deborat Mishra. When I came here, what I was hoping to do was to kind of see beneath the kind of tourist India and to actually meet some families to get to know how really the place works culturally and, and as a and family unit. And what's great about being here today is I've actually got the privilege of proper insight into family life. I can't wait, actually, to spend some time with them. They're adorable. So I don't nick one of the children. Mm. A bit embarrassing, wouldn't it? That little one could easily fit in my rucksack. It's divine. Do the, um, do the gentlemen ever come into the kitchen? Because my husband's a really good cook. Does your husband cook? Yeah. He does? He's a good cook. But he never cooks for me. Right. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why then, is he not cooking for you? Because he said if uh, one time if I cook for you, so you said every day that cook for me, cook for me. And so does your mother-in-law cook with you sometimes? Oh, my mother-in-law? Yeah. No. She does. You do all the cooking now. Yeah. You do all the cooking for everybody. How many people live here? Ten. Ten. Is that okay? Is it nice yes. to live with everybody? We love live together. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> I love my sisters, but I don't know if we could all live together all the time. We Indians believe that guest is like a god. And in which form, in which costume, in which form God will arrive in your home, you never know. So for us, you Might are be God. Me. Yeah, you Thank are. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. How do I start? Do I start with this or? Uh, with okay. right uh, finger. My right finger, yeah. yeah. And you see, this is a five elements. Uh -huh. And is it, does everybody, is the whole of India, everybody eats with their hands? Everybody? Yeah. Yeah. But I'll be able to, for the rest of my journey, should I try to eat with my hand? Sure, sure. Well, I think people think that's odd, though, with the no, Western person. That, that's actually the thing, really, the, the, uh, you respect Indian culture, you know? Yeah, okay. They would really feel, you know, when you are with family. When I'm living with, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's okay. really the respect. And if you really want to enjoy India, yeah. you need to... You need to be with family. To join in. Join in. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for cooking. <laughs> I'm really, so welcome. I'm really happy. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, it's really taste well. <laughs> Rani, Ragni, you, you help a bit or you help a lot? She's okay. She's okay. No? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had to tell her what to do all the time. It's so <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Later that evening, I head back out onto the river to meet up with Ravi to attend an evening prayer ceremony. The funeral pyres continue to burn into the night. It seems that the Ganga never sleeps. I've come to see the evening's Aarti, which is a daily Hindu ritual, where the people of Varanasi offer prayers and thanks to their beloved river. Oh, 
Hello. Are they for making a prayer? Yeah, can I have six, please? Six. Yeah. Thank you. That's a lot of prayers I've got to do. Yeah, I will be there. During the ceremony, the candles are lit and sent down the river as a personal prayer to loved ones and an offering to God. I've lit six candles for my family back home. but it's not at all sombre because everybody's here and it's like Hyde Park at some sort of festival. Everyone's chatting and talking to each other and taking photographs and it's kind of really full of life and fun and there's nothing kind of sombre or morbid about it. It's very, very beautiful and they're praying to Mother Ganges. They're praying to the river. Quite smoky. I'm sorry to say goodbye to this fabulous place. But tomorrow, I leave Varanasi and head out west to Rajasthan. I've dashed down to Delhi to get the train to Jodhpur. I want to cover as much ground as possible in the short time I'm here in India, and the easiest way to get around this huge country is by the infamous Indian railway system. The railways are a cornerstone of everyday Indian life and traverse the length and breadth of the country. It carries over 20 million passengers and 2 million tonnes of freight daily. Like everywhere else I've been to in India so far, it's heaving with people and animals, and they all seem to be coping with the heat a lot better than me. Oh, I can't stand any of this. What does it say? Um, What's hot? Platform number hot. Oh my God, it's going. Oh. Very much, thanks. Now, um, well, I, I don't really know where I'm going. Going. I know. Where, I hope I know where I'm going. I hope I'm going to Rajasthan. I don't know where I'm going to sleep because I can't see any numbers on any of the beds. So I don't know where I'm going to spend the night. Slightly disconcerting. Um, quite crowded. Might have to share a bunk with somebody. I eventually find my sleeping berth, and as the train pulls out of the station and dusk sets in, I prepare myself for the long 385-mile journey ahead. The um, Indian railway system is extraordinary, actually, and is the biggest employer in India, employing two million people. It's actually the second biggest employer in the world, the largest being the Chinese army and the third largest is the British National Health Service. It's not really relevant at this point, but I'm quite tired. You might need to know that one day. So yeah, two million people employed by this railway system and not one lavatory cleaner. It's a shocker. Oh, hi, yeah, can I have a chai, please? I've only got 100, is that all right? Have you got change? Um, I've just bought this little cup of chai for five rupees and basically it's tea but it's masala tea, masala chai and it has milk already in it and lots of little spices and loads of sugar. It's absolutely delicious, very very hot. It's yum, getting quite used to it. You know, I'm a bit, a bit tired. I 
I spoke to my kids today on the phone as well. Um, I'm a bit homesick really, just missing them. And my husband said he was about to sit down and cook them all breakfast, bacon and eggs, and about to light a fire and everything. Just thought about my babies. Traveled 12 hours through the night from India's capital Delhi to the city of Jodhpur in Rajasthan. After a rather restless night, listening to the rhythmic snores of my neighbor, the train finally arrives at its destination. Unlike me, the city is still sleeping. Jodhpur. My first stop in Rajasthan, the land of kings. It has a rich and romantic past and was a setting for Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book. As much as I'd love to catch up with Mowgli and Baloo, there's no time, because I'm meeting up with local lady Anu instead. Rajasthani food is famous for its distinctive spicy flavours. I love to cook and eat, so when Anu says she'll teach me a local dish, I practically bite her hand off. Oh, shopping! For no, lunch. lunch. Yeah, that's exciting for me. Wow, this is. Uh, do um, do people ever crash into each other here? Do the truck trucks ever come to grief? Oh my God, that's. Oh, that was so nearly a crash. Oh my God. Hello. Hello, little children. Oh, they darling little children. Yeah, I love beetroot. Yes? Yeah. Anu takes me to the best food market in town. The sights, sounds and smells are divine, and the simple task of shopping amongst the stalls is a sensory delight. Ooh! It smells lovely, doesn't it? This is made up of uh, wheat flour, boiled milk, boiled milk and sugar. And sugar. Nice? No, very nice. The shopping with Anu is just so exciting because it means I get to see all of those colours and smell those smells and, and witness some of the things that she sees every day. Um, the only thing I don't like, really, about the local shopping is the streets are incredibly narrow and although the cows are lovely and very beautiful and everyone says they treat them with huge respect, they're slightly unnerving and I was OK about them until Anu, actually, um, so <laughs> let escape that she's quite scared of them because um, they have been known to actually lose it. I don't know, they just get bad tempered, and some of those big um, bullocks could really frighten you if they came heading down a street at you. It'd be like being in Pamplona, only um, less fun. Um, it's a bit odd actually having all the cows in the street because back at home in Devon, I'm used to seeing cows as ruminants and, and grazing on really lush green grass. and. And here, they just seem to graze on, uh, well, plastic, mostly. I've discovered something called paneer, which you probably all know about, but it's new to me. And it's a sort of um, cottage cheese, they described it as curd cheese, really, which you cut into cubes and you eat it in a curry sauce. So I'm going to learn how to do that so I can cook it when I go home. And Anu's going to teach me. That's really good dye. Lovely. There's quite a lot of oil. What now? What's that? Oh, cumin seeds. Cumin, yeah. Oh, it's lovely. It's got really good orange, that, hasn't it? Yes. Coriander powder. Oh, okay. This we need more. A lot of it. Yeah. yeah. OK, so you mix that into your yoghurt before? Yes, before. I think that's where I go wrong, because that's it tastes, I can taste the dry spice sometimes. Is that green chilli? Green chilli. Oh, Hard OK, chili. yeah. This is 
Burası espinaç böreği. Exactly the same colour as your. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so do you always cook to match your clothes? <laughs> I can hear the train coming in. I came in on that train. I've got previous with that train. <laughs> the problem I had with the train was that I was sleeping next to a man that was making really unspeakable noises. I'm not used to being surrounded by people I don't know sleeping really, really close to you. Yeah. I... Gentlemen that you don't know. It, right. You there. don't like that. I don't like that. You see, yeah. I'd been alright. If I'd have been with you, if you'd have been lying next to me, I'd have been really happy about that. There was a man who was a bit grunty. Yeah, man. Oh yeah, man, I know. Not good, is it? <laughs> so it's ready. It's ready, beautiful. Palak paneer. Palak paneer. Done. It's very good, isn't it? Mm. It's very good. You know, Rajasthan is famous for food. Is it? <clears throat> yes, Rajasthani dishes. Really, they're very yeah. famous. I can see yeah. why, actually, because it's completely wonderful flavours. Parakeets at 12 o'clock. Jodhpur, also known as the Blue City, is a breathtaking blanket of painted buildings. I've never seen anything like it. It's stunning. Blue is the traditional colour of the Brahmin, the highest caste in India. But interestingly, this shade is also said to keep those pesky mosquitoes away. I don't know anything about this beautiful city, but I'm eager to learn. I love castles and forts, so I'm meeting Bozo Singh, nephew to the Maharaja of Jodhpur. I'll be hanging out with actual Indian royalty. Everyone back home will be so impressed. The our ancestors came here in the 12th century, where it was built by Rao Joda in the 15th century, hence the name Jodhpur, the town. It was founded by him. And the reasons why they were built was obviously the sign of power. Yes, yeah. And, you know, it is a heck of a sign of power, yeah. isn't it? If, I suppose if you're going to make a statement, I think <laughs> this is the one to make. They did make a statement, yeah. and they, they had to, I suppose, in that time. Yeah. And uh, this is where they housed the army, they stayed here. Oh, the army were here? The army would uh -huh, stay here okay. also, predominantly all the stables, all the army barracks, plus the quarters of the Maharaja and his family. I mean, it was a full working city in a way, more than a house. Yes, yeah, a sort of city above the city. Above the city, and yeah. Presumably the city has actually grown enormously. It's grown incredibly. I mean, you can see it at some point, but the, the old walled city, which it used to be. Yes. And it's obviously exceeded much And gone beyond the walls. Oh, right, OK. Over the period of time. Yeah. As you can see, the mostly all these sort of blue houses and white houses that you see. It's so lovely. <laughs> it's lovely. Can you, I, I know you've known it all your life, but does it still take your breath away? It does. It, every time I'm here, I mean, I, I mean, no matter how many times you see it, there, there's something about it. You're absolutely right. I mean, it's you completely can't, ma can't magical. <laughs> it is. Your uncle lives over there and he has part of that house. House. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's, it's it's it a is a house. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'd normally call it the shack up on the hill. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, you know. Sorry. The palace. <laughs> He has half of the palace, is that right? It, it's, uh, yeah, he has quite a bit of, a bit of the section where he lives yeah. and his family lives. And the rest of it is all a uh, hotel. Absolutely, it's beautiful here, absolutely. It's probably the most extraordinary place I've ever been in my life. Well, thank you. Some say the Hamaranga Fort is the most majestic of Rajasthan's forts. And Rudyard Kipling described it as the creation of angels, fairies and giants. And I can see why. This has been one of the most amazing days of my life. India is vast, so I'm leapfrogging from one amazing city to the next. I'm in Agra, and I'm on a mission to visit the iconic Taj Mahal. I've seen too many postcards and posters of this monument in my lifetime to miss out on the chance of actually seeing it in the flesh. It's about 350 miles to Agra, beats my Exeter to London commute hands down. Which year country? England. England. Yeah. So, England is very beautiful. 
I love England. I love, I love India. <laughs> Yeah, oh great. Well, they bring one. Uh, bring on the bananas. You want a banana? How many bananas? Banana. Banana. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're nice bananas. We finally make it to Agra, and I check into my guest house, run by the charming Colonel and Mrs. Lamber. Annoyingly, the Taj is shut today. However, the delightful Colonel invites me to visit his temple and show me around. Of course, I leap at the chance. You know me, I don't like to miss out on anything. We arrive at the Gudwara, which is a Sikh place of worship. Sikhism was founded in Punjab in northern India in the 15th century and has the basic principles of service, humility and equality. The temple serves meals all day, which are available for anyone who is hungry, regardless of class or religion. Only 1.9% of India's population is Sikh, but that's over 22 million people. And this is just cleansing before we go into the temple? Ah, that's a normal. This is a Langar Hall, where the people come up here. This is one of our tenets, that anybody can come up here and without caste and creed, they can have a food. So, so these people will be eating, they don't necessarily have to pay for their meal? No, they don't have to pay anything. You just sit there, people will come and serve you. There are volunteers standing, waiting for the people to come up here and sit here. So if this is gone, then the other people will come up. It's a continuous process, morning till evening. Maybe 15,000, maybe 20,000 people eat every day here. Really? So it's a, the kitchen's continually kitchen feeding keeps on, people? It keeps on making it. Yeah. See the hot, absolutely fresh things are made here. I'm never going to complain about cooking supper for my family ever again. So this is the um, this is the engine room of yeah. the kitchen. Yes, that's the kitchen. This is a behind the curtain. This is what people do, and they all ladies come up here. Everybody makes a thing here. What's this one? Is this um, is this ro roti? Roti. Roti. Hundreds of roti. Here. Yes, hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of roti. Of roti. Yeah. And then this chap takes them over yes. to yes, they to, take. to the oven, to is it, or to the hot plate? Hot plate. And then they put the things there, and they they put they're putting an oil in that. Right. So that the, it doesn't get hard. So they put an oil into that. Soft. Ah, it okay. mean, soft. They are expecting quite a few people. to work, don't yes. they? Even, so if he's, even if he's cleaning street, he's working. Yes. He has to work. He has to work. He has to work. You don't have to beg. That is why this community kitchen is there. Yeah. If he's not been able to uh, 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 earn so much yeah. that he cannot look after his family or something, he can come to the Gurdwara and have a free. free. To, uh, to feed himself free. and his yes, family. He can do that. Up early the next morning, at last, the time has come to fulfill my childhood dream of seeing the Taj Mahal for real. OK, pub quiz time. What was built between 1631 and 1653 took 20,000 people working day and night 22 years to complete. You got it. And isn't she beautiful? Legend has it that when it was finished, the workers' hands were cut off so they could never replicate their work. The Taj Mahal is one of the new seven wonders of the world, built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan in memory of his favourite wife, Mumtaz Mahal, who, as she was dying giving birth to their 14th child, asked him to build her a heaven on earth. Even though it's one of the greatest love stories ever told, an embodiment of eternal love in white marble, this great mausoleum has become the perfect backdrop for tourist photographs. Okay. This is a white chloroform is over here. Oh, look, all right. I think if, I, if you make me look tall and thin and blonde on the yes. Diana bench, that'd be ideal. Was I going to get sucked into it? Of course I was. Definitely 
one ticked off the list. I'm very glad to have visited the Taj, but now I'm quite ready to break away from the tourist trail and leave the madness of the city behind me. Rural India still retains one foot in the past, and I'm keen to experience this for myself. I'm going to meet a man called Thakur Praduman Singh. He's the head of a village called Chandaleo, way out in the countryside. So for me, this is a bit like going home because it's out in the sticks, it's rural, hopefully it's a bit like Devon, a bit green. Lots of animals, some birds, a bit of wildlife, and lots of rural people, which is what I like and what I'm used to. Praduman Singh's home has been in his family for 18 generations and recently he's converted it into a heritage hotel. He's typical of many high-status Indians who are struggling to keep their homes since the ruling families lost their power a few years after India gained its independence from Britain in 1947. Chandaleo has a population of just 1,800 people and Praduman is going to take me on a tour of the village to meet some of them and give me a real insight into everyday rural life. <laughs> oh, be careful! Be careful, little children! <laughs> Praduman drove me to the town hall, where a daily meeting known as Asaba was taking place. Here the village elders were participating in an ancient custom that might be frowned upon in the West. And believe me, this is a far cry from the Tiverton WI. This is the village uh, community meeting. Oh, community meeting, right. And it's only the, only the, the men? The yeah, normally it's only the men. Yeah. But you can come in. Yeah. Thank you. Padman, what are they doing here? Brewing opium. Brewing opium? Yeah, you can sit here. Gosh, that's you can <laughs> great. Um, yeah. What's the actual opium look like? Can I have a look at some opium? Yeah, that's what it looks like. How is it left? It looks like fudge. It looks like a big piece of fudge. Really not for me, thanks. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Even though opium is illegal in India, a special exemption is made for traditional opium tea drinking in this area. Delicious? Is it nice? Nice, is it? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Fortifying, OK. <laughs> Make you strong. Yeah. And does everybody like to have a little bit of opium at the... Yeah, it's like a custom they have it. A custom, OK. No, really, thank you. I really, I really don't want to try it. Thank you so much. I really don't think... It'd be... All right, you can... <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Push it. <laughs> 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 yeah, thanks very much. Is this going to be it's, worse? It's, it's not mineral water. What is this? It's local water. Well, it's better than that. Hello. It's so unpleasant. Thank you very much. That was horrible. <laughs> so what sort of things are you going to be discussing here? All development work for the village, social issues. Could be anything. Could be a marriage. I mean, this here, of course, it's more of uh, development work and social media. But I'm starting to feel quite peculiar, so I can't believe anyone actually does much sort of serious work here. No, no, they're not. Because I'm already feeling quite weird. No, it's not. Oh, that's a bit of chocolate now. Pardon me, you prefer? Some chocolate. Anyone got any chocolate? I think I might have the munchies. You won't have a lot. Why? Because you've got work to do. Yeah, I don't have it. I just had it because. Because we. They, they were there. They, yeah. they, 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 they expect. Why don't you have it? Yeah, it's addictive. I could do with some fresh air, so Pradaman takes me to a stunning lake on the outskirts of the village. 
This lake is the main source of drinking water for Chandaleo and a magnet for wildlife. Now, this is probably something you don't know about me, but I'm something of an amateur bird watcher. Well, what's that? See, so look at the kingfisher. Oh, OK, yeah. hang on, hang on. On, on the wire. Do you mind stopping? Yeah, 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 yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Hang on, hang on. Oh, just hang on. Just... We have two types of kingfishers here. Yeah. This the white-breasted and the pied kingfisher. I don't know either of them. But this is more colourful and more beautiful. Look at that beak. Yeah. It's bright orange in his bill, isn't it? Now, what's that little green thing? That's the green bee eater. Oh, well, yes, I've heard of that. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's so lovely green, that little bee eater. That sounds like a peacock. Hello! Like that, <laughs> isn't it? That's what's that? exact sound like a peacock. Doesn't it? Yeah. And unsurprisingly, the kingfisher's gone. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't, maybe it went on the bus. <laughs> so we've got, what do you say, painted storks. See the pink? Yeah, just on the tips of their, their tail, yeah. tail feathers. And here they are, they're going to breed because some of them are making nests. Yeah, I can see someone was nesting. Yeah, on, there, on that tree. Yeah. yeah. What's great for me about the way I'm travelling around India, I'm staying in smaller hotels and haveli and bed and breakfast and things and living with families, is I think it's giving me a really different insight into the way things work here. And although it's fantastic to go and see all the great um, tourist attractions, there's so much more um, to be found here. And um, I'm finding that really exciting and, and um, a bit of a privilege, actually, to be allowed um, sort of into people's lives a bit. town in Gujarat is not a typical stop on the tourist trail but an unusual sort of tourism has brought me here Gujarat the birthplace of Gandhi is a modern business state and people come here from all over the world seeking help from infertility expert dr. Naina Patel I actually read about this clinic whilst I was back in England and I'm keen to come and meet some of the women who act as surrogates um, because a lot of them are from rural communities, the sort of places that I've been visiting. We've all heard about uh, medical tourism, where people go and have a nose job or a hip replacement in, in Spain or somewhere like that, but this is the first time I've ever really had any dealings or have even heard about surrogate tourism, where women from a nation will carry babies for, for couples all over the world who, who, for one reason or another, can't, can't actually carry their own children. I'm interested to see, really, I suppose, how, how ancient rural India is, um, is working with modern, technologically advanced India. Thank you. Dr. Naina Patel, the face of the surrogate industry in India, has offered to show me around the boarding house where many of the expectant surrogate mothers live until they give birth. This is a baby shower. It's a baby shower. In the Hindu, this thing, we believe that uh, when we do this ritual at the month, seventh month, we are praying to God that let this lady have a safe delivery and the baby and the mother should have no problem. Quite comforting, actually, at this yes, time, I imagine. This time. Yeah, it's Because at about seven months, the reality of birth starts to come to you, doesn't it? Dr. Patel knows each of the surrogate mothers personally and monitors them on a day-to-day -day basis. Place where they meet up with the family on Sundays, the husband, the children, they come over to meet. Yeah, so there are some more surrogates. Hello. Hello. Good. This reminds me like a girls' dormitory at my boarding school. Yes, it's like a boarding school. They yeah. all meet, sit, drink together and... Fun. Do they talk? Do they talk when the lights go out. Do they chatter after lights out? Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. The, uh, the girls and, and women that are here have all had babies of their own, haven't they? Yes. Before they come. Yes. Yeah. Because 
first they would know that what they are entering into if they have never had been pregnant before or delivered they they don't know what job they are going into so first they should know that secondly after delivering the baby the emotional attachment also is important whether they'll be able to give this baby away though it's not their baby and uh, third is that from medical point of view if a lady has had an uneventful pregnancy with no complications there are very good chances that the second time on also she will have a normal pregnancy and delivery when you gave this baby to her parents was it sad for you no because uh, they are happy well that's a very beautiful daughter yes. and i'm sure you do miss her sometimes but she's very <laughs> lovely and i'm sure she's brought a lot of happiness to her parents spending time with these women has been an eye-opening experience for me and i was moved by the warm friendly atmosphere and the strong bond these women have with each other it costs around £16,000 to hire a surrogate mother here. It would cost more than double that in the UK. And the legalities in India are less complicated. This is the IVF lab and the recovery room. Through IVF, we take the egg of that infertile lady, fertilize with her husband's sperms. We create an embryo in the lab. And it is this embryo that's implanted in her uterus. So it's no way connected to her, not at all her genetic baby. So this is where the women will have the egg implant. Egg retrieval and implant. Right. Yeah. So what sort of women would need to use surrogacy? Yes. If you see, one in six couple all over the world uh, are infertile. And out of those... One just in six? One in six. And out of those, just three to six percent of the infertile couples would need a surrogate. The females who are born without a uterus, that we call MRKH syndrome, or who has been hysterectomized, the uterus has been removed, or she is physically incapable of carrying a child because of her medical disorders. Dr. Patel explains to me that the majority of surrogate women here come from very poor backgrounds, that undergoing a pregnancy earns them life-changing money. They come from a background where they work as a maid. It's a labor work, after all, and they are paid peanuts for that. I would say they would be earning less than $50 a month. And here, in a nine months time, they earn close to 8,000 US dollars. So that's a big amount for them, an amount which can buy them a house, help for their children's education, and start a small business also. So their life has a total change. So what's the percentage of twins? Almost 30 to 35. And to, to, forgive the question, but do people have to pay twice for two babies? No, no, 25% extra. Oh. <laughs> That's a bargain. You go for triplets, you get one free. <laughs> Buy two, get one no. free. <laughs> triplets are not allowed. No, oh, aren't they? So quite often they, people will go home with two babies. Yes. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. So this is the backup. Dr Patel has an appointment to scan a surrogate mum who is five months pregnant. This is uh, Shabnam. She's doing surrogacy for the second time. And the first time she did for an American couple, again for an American couple. This time she's carrying twins. And you can see the heart of the baby, I think, yes, already. Look at that lively little baby! Yes. <laughs> Look at that. Wow! Both the babies are really doing fine. So did this lady have twins before or one baby? No, one baby. One baby. Yes, one baby. They are two lovely babies. <laughs> It's a shame that, you know, those women can't carry their own babies, but this is, is as good as it's going to get for them. Yeah. At least they will have their the genetic help. baby they and will. they can see That's themselves in the baby, yes. It was good to come to Anand to see a different side of India, one which is progressive and fighting against tradition. Because of the legal and financial obstacles involved with surrogacy in the West, more and more people are heading east in the hope of starting a family. Unless surrogacy laws change in the future, India will be the world leaders in this booming industry. I'm coming towards the end of the first leg of my journey here in India and I've got the most amazing images in my head. Yeah, the river Ganga at dawn and then the fantastic religious festivals there in the evening with the, the candles going down the river. Jodhpur, the blue city, the land of the kings, Rajasthan, which is so incredibly powerful and romantic. What I'm realising is the thing I love best about this place is the people.